morning, brothers and sisters. It is great to be with you this morning. I want to invite you to stand as we join in song together and praise our Lord. Let's just lift our praises to Him. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. I grabbed a handful of what um, <laughs> Mary Jo asked me to pick up, and I, because we're supposed to grab a handful, 
Actually, she said, grab a stack. And I just said, no, I, if I bring the stack up here, they will be all over. So I just grabbed a handful of these things. They're cards for the uh, some vacation Bible school that we're invited to take with us. So that's a, that's a pre-announcement to the pre-announcements, okay? Um, so I'm grateful to be here. My name is Tom Denham. Um, this is First Alliance Church, and if you're visiting today, we're grateful to have you here with us in the sanctuary as well as online. Um, we know that God is working everywhere in the world, and we're eager to be a part of that as we join him and see what he's doing, not only here, but around the world. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, if you like, you can pick up a Connect card from the back of the pew and fill it out. There's two sides to that Connect card. One is for information as to who you are and what God's doing in your life. The other side is prayer requests. So if you have something you'd like us to pray for as the elders or as a church, we'd love to hear from you so that we can keep you before the King of Kings who answers prayer. So please feel free to take those, deposit them in the offering boxes in the back. A couple upcoming announcements for you. Parents versus Youth Night. Oh, that looks pretty severe, doesn't it? One boxing glove against another. Well, my understanding is nothing like that. It is come together, have some games, some food, some friendly competition, and share about what you've been learning, which is kind of neat. I'm not sure if the parents are going to have to share, so I just said, yes, be ready so that you're ready to uh, share what God is teaching you as well. Summer Youth Camp coming up, 2024, June. Uh, that's 17 to the 22nd. I, yep, it's there on the left. Um, please be praying for that. Um, but there's also the opportunity to sponsor a student that's coming. So um, be praying that God would lead the students. That we've got a bunch here that we could send that way. Um, I don't know what Sam's plans are, how he has that worked up, but I'm sure it's there for a reason so that you can pray that we could send our students, our middle school and high school students as well. And then I have a, a special individual I'd like to call to the stage, Mr. Jim Brigham, who's going to give us some information and give us a little bit of presentation about the Walk for Life coming up this Saturday at 9 a.m. Hey, folks. Um, I just wanted to give you one last opportunity to uh, join the movement to change our city. This coming Saturday, April 20th, it's going to be at Blue Jacket Park in the Baldwin Park area, and it's um, the Walk for Life to raise funds for the Choices Women's Clinic. Uh, the theme this year is called Faithful Through Generations, and um, it's really, it's a great opportunity. Uh, there's people from all generations, all walks of life who come out and just um, are there to uh, take, take a stand and take a walk for the sanctity of human life. Um, I'm sure you're fully aware that this is uh, a big issue in our culture these days. And um, God uh, touched me uh, many years ago and spoke to my heart. Uh, when I was a new believer, I came to church and they, they were talking about um, sanctity of human life. And I thought, well, why are they talking about politics in church? And um, I was turned off, honestly. But then I started studying the scriptures, and I read um, in Deuteronomy 30:19. it says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And that, that's touched my heart. That spoke to me. I went on, and I studied more. And in the book of Jeremiah, it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And also, uh, King David in Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So I just wanted to encourage you. Uh, the enemy is wanting to keep us quiet about this. And I, I feel called to be a voice for the voiceless and to, to take a stand for um, the sanctity of human life. And I hope you would uh, join me, join us. Um, there's many from our church who have come over the years. Uh, 
we had uh, about 14, five years ago, and we would love to, to have you all come out. They have games and things for the kids. They make it a fun event. There's even donuts and coffee and just, uh, so come on out. And if you can't be there, uh, I'd love uh, to talk with you afterwards. We have a table set up. And I would also love to just talk with you if, if it's something that you're struggling with about, you know, what does this mean? I mean, what, what does the Bible say about the sanctity of human life? I, I would love to talk with you about it. So thanks. Thank you, Jim. Amen to that. This is a critical issue. This is not something that um, we can take for light. And we've been killing our children for the last 50 years. And I believe God is very displeased with that. I read a, a text this week from um, a news agency, and apparently someone compared it, the abortions that we've been doing and the existence of the arguments for to the arguments for slavery in the mid-1800s. And um, the, you find there are parallels in history throughout our lives and our country, and this is one of those that really, when I read that text, went into it and read it thoroughly it was really shocking beyond what the scripture says of the value of our life i was thinking exactly of psalm 139 jim when you were talking because we are fearfully and wonderfully made and our soul knows it very well i'm going to invite you to stand and uh, greet one another with that understanding take some life from yourself and give it to someone else this morning greet them welcome them Hello, Zach. There we are. Everybody, thank you so much. Could you return to your seats as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship? While you're coming back, I, I did mention the uh, jungle adventure this coming June, 10 to 14, in these cards. They're for us to take and give away. Um, and I want to urge you, the youth in our community need Jesus 
They're being fed a lot of untruth. And it's up to us to replace that with the truth. So this is one way we can do that. Take them to business, take them to your schools, take them anywhere, hand them out, make them, make those piles disappear. Oh, never mind, make those piles disappear and the ones that Mary Jo has that she's gonna bring back to replenish. Um, I'd like to share from one, Psalm 121. This is one of the readings that I hit this morning as we're continuing to rejoice in the Lord and adore him. I lift my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade, is your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. It's quite a set of promises, isn't it? Watches you over us. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come before you to continue worshiping and adoring you, um, we're grateful for the attributes that we see, that you don't slumber, you don't sleep. You're constantly watching over us that you're our shade and our right hand, our shield. Nothing comes to harm us that you don't allow, even, that you are bound to use for our good, for making us more into the image of Jesus Christ. And you will keep us from harm. I don't know how many times, Lord, I've acknowledged that I could have been in a serious accident and you kept me from it. And I understand why you have, except that your grace and your mercy is so full and so overwhelming. We commit ourselves to you now, Lord, as we continue our worship, Lord, we cause our hearts to be full to overflowing and transform our lives as we give our praises to you, the audience of one. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand to continue.
declares, my house will be a house of prayer. I wonder if we can't just take a moment now. Where you are. Let's focus on Him. Let's dwell on being in His presence. Think about how you can praise Him this morning. Think about what He has done for you. cleansing us from our wickedness and be calling us back to you. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the light in a dark world. Jesus, be magnified in us. 
Jesus. I will bow to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be feel like they can't make it another moment. Bring your joy, Lord, that overwhelms. We lift you high. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Morning, folks. Oh. Mm. You know, most of you don't know me well, but over the I have led quite a few organizations. Uh, being a, a banker for 21 years and a leader in the bank and uh, sitting on 12 different not-for-profit board of directors as well as uh, churches and leading churches. And, and one thing I found is that organizations are difficult to lead. And churches are no different. <laughs> it's possible to be a large church and not be an effective church. A group of people can gather together one or two times a week and sing some songs and listen to a sermon and maybe say a prayer or two and, and call it church but that does not constitute an effective church. An effective church is a church that worships and glorifies God. It seeks to guide the lost people to salvation in Jesus Christ. It disciples and matures believers. It serves the community in unconditional love, and it does it all for the glory of God, not the church. This morning, I want you to know that God's will for First Alliance Church of Orlando is to be effective for him. Our goal as a church is to be successful for the glory of God. Now, let me define what I mean by success. Right? Success is, number one, knowing God's will. Number two, it's opening the road to Jesus, removing those stumbling blocks that I spoke about 
last week. Success is us bearing witness of our Jesus Christ experience. Success is us sharing the gospel message. Success is us advancing God's kingdom. And success is ensuring that God is glorified. And when all this is done effectively, then Jesus builds his church. How many of you would agree with me this morning that Paul was effective in building churches and the kingdom of God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of proof of that success, don't we? Most of the book of Acts documents his success. And, of course, we have 13 books of the New Testament that are attributed to him. So I thought it would benefit us to examine some of the things that made Paul successful for Christ. Things that can lead First Alliance Church of Orlando to be an effective church for the glory of God. Are you with me? All right. Let's turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 15. Let me read that for you. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Pergia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of, of, a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day we went to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. Notice there weren't too many men there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Theatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this is your word and your truth. And Lord, our desire for you this morning is that you open up your truth to our hearts, Lord. Lord, may we hear from you in a powerful way, Lord. Guide us through your word. Open up our hearts. Reveal yourself to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Up to this point, Paul had been traveling with Barnabas, his member, his mentor. And they had been successful in building God's kingdom and, and planting churches. And so they made plans to visit the churches that they had established, but there was a sharp disagreement between them over whether or not to allow John Mark to go with them. And as a result, they split up. Barnabas went off with John Mark, and Paul chose Silas to join him. And Paul and Silas went through Syria and Cilicia, visiting churches. They traveled to Derby. they went to, to Lystra, and they, they met a young man by the name of Timothy. And Timothy joined them in their journey and their ministry. And they continued their travels through the region, encouraging the establishing church, established churches and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result, churches were established, churches were strengthened, and the kingdom increased in number daily. Then they made plans to move their ministry into Asia. But they found out that God had other plans for them. They tried to go into Asia one way, and that didn't work, so, so they tried to go in another way. 
And though their intentions were honorable, their plans were not what God intended for them. However, their heart's desire was for God's kingdom, saving lost souls and fulfilling the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, which takes me to essential number one of an effective church, desire. The desire to minister to and serve the Lord. If we have the desire to be in God's will and to do God's work, he will guide us. The keys are having this hunger and thirst to to obey his will. We also got to be sincere about wanting to be in the will of God. And we must take seriously the model prayer given to us by Jesus. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. From the reading, we can see that Paul had a desire to share the gospel in Asia. But the Holy Spirit would not allow them. Paul had the right intention, but the wrong direction. But his actions before, during, and after show us the importance of having a desire to minister to and serve God. Now remember that Paul, Paul had been called and commissioned by none other than the resurrected Jesus Christ. In Acts 9.15, we're told of his mission for God. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And from that moment, the moment that Jesus confronted him on the Damascus Road, Paul was obedient to that calling. You see... He had experienced the love and the forgiveness of God found in Jesus Christ. And since he had experienced the love, his greatest desire was to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. He wanted everybody to experience that same love, that same joy that he felt. And even though he had to face all kinds of hardships and persecutions, he was never deterred from his mission. His biggest desire was to do the ministry that he had been called by God to do. As a church, we have a calling. We have a specific purpose. This church still exists because God has a plan for it, a plan to build his kingdom through First Alliance Church in Orlando. And a desire to minister and serve God is the first essential step towards being an effective church. But we must make sure that our desire is within God's will. And this leads us to essential number two of an effective church, discernment. Discernment. Discernment is the ability to hear and know God's will. It's also a spiritual ability that enables us to know right from wrong, and it also allows us to know good people from from evil people, right? Though it can be a gift of the Holy Spirit given to an individual, like most gifts, the Holy Spirit can provide it to others as needed. You know, and I know for many of us, God's will is not always easily discerned. You know why? Usually because we don't stop to listen. We don't stop to listen. That's one reason. Reason number two is the noise of the world seems to block out that still, soft voice that is meant for us as individuals. See, see, when, when we, we want to hear God, what do we expect? We expect thunder, lightning, a booming voice. But when God has a message that is meant for you, he intimately whispers in your ear, And if you're not listening, or there are too many peripheral sounds around you, you miss his voice. So we must purposely stop and listen intently for God. And I love during the worship service, it was just that time of, of the music, and we went into prayer. We need to do more of that and just be still before the Lord as we worship together 
and listen for his voice. But God can also take another route, right? God's plan was clearly not evident to Paul and Silas. They traveled over 600 miles before God's will became clear to them. However, with the lack of specific direction from the Lord, they acted on his general direction. What's his general direction? Well, he's given us two commands that I see as his general direction for us. First is found in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's his general direction. The other one is found in Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will, has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They operated on his general direction, and that direction is always found in Scripture. So in the absence of God's specific direction, operate your life in his general direction as found in scriptures. The more we know, listen to, and study the word of God, the easier it is to hear his voice, recognize his voice, and know his will. Let me give you a secret of seeing God's will in scripture. When you're reading scripture, don't just look at it for content. Don't just read it for knowledge. When you read scripture, read it to hear God's voice and message specifically for you. Okay? This is the A in tap that David Remenschneider presented a couple of weeks ago. Remember back then? It was probably a couple of months ago, right? Practical application. When you sit down to read scripture, pray Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And then be still before the Lord and watch how loudly you will hear God speak to you through the Holy Spirit and his scripture. Know that God's desire for you will never, ever, ever go contrary to scripture and his character. We're told that Paul finally received specific direction from God. He got a vision from God. A man from Macedonia in the vision pleads to him, come and help us. Now, you got to understand something. If there was a culture in the world at that time that didn't seem to need help, it was the Greek culture. The Greeks had everything, and they were prideful about it. They had tremendous philosophers they had great orators they had fantastic architecture they had quality arts they had exciting sports and their language was the internationally accepted language anything they wanted they had but there was one thing they did not have they did not have true hope everlasting eternal hope and Paul was to go and introduce them to the love, forgiveness, and hope found in Jesus Christ. Folks, when, when God wants to give you specific instructions, when he wants you to go in another direction, he will guide you through the Holy Spirit. And in the future weeks, we're going to spend some time studying the work of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand it clearly and understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in our lives and for the ministry of Jesus Christ. Okay? But the key right now, what I want you to think about is listening and getting to know his voice and having the desire to do his will. Okay? So prayer and fasting become a key to knowing God's specific will for your life and our ministry. And we're also going to spend some time in prayer and learning how to pray effectively and powerfully. 
Now, I know when I say fasting, most of you think of skipping a meal. I'm not one. I don't like to skip meals. How many of you like to skip meals? I'm not a a meal-skipping type of guy. I want to redefine fasting for you. Fasting is eliminating what is distracting you for the purpose of relating to God and hearing his voice. Fasting is eliminating what is distracting you for the purpose of relating to God and hearing his voice. Fasting does not begin with giving something up. Fasting begins with prayer, worship, and listening. Fasting begins when we purposefully draw near to God. Does that make sense? Pray for the Lord to direct you in life and direct his church. And let's stop going to God only when we need his help in times of trouble. And start going to God to hear his will. And please note that even though you may have good intentions, God's direction is more important. Churches fail because they may be doing good things with good intentions that are not in God's will. There are many Christian churches that begin to serve in in the Lord's will, and then they decide what what they want to do is more important. And sometimes God wants to do something new, and, and the church refuses. So instead of following the Holy Spirit, the church follows their own desires. God tells them to go one way, and they go another way. God tells them to do one thing, and they do another. And as a result, Jesus stops building his church. Spiritual maturity stops. And God is not glorified. Sometimes we have worthy desires, but they are not what God would have us do. So we try to fit God's will into our plans. It doesn't work that way. If we're to be effective as a church of Jesus Christ and men and women of God, we must listen and follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. It's the only way for us to have proper discernment. And as we seek to move forward as Christian individuals and as a church, we must have discernment. There may be places we want to go, things we want to do, things we want to continue, and tasks that we want to accomplish. There may come from legitimate, pure desires. But God will not bless those that for the right reasons do things that are not in his will. Always take the proper steps to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when he says no, we must accept it and move in the direction that he provides. That's one thing we learn from Paul, isn't it? Which takes us to the next essential of an effective church, dedication or devotion. Direction from God is is vital for consistent success and it is intertwined with discernment but knowing God's will is not enough we must be dedicated to follow his direction God gave Paul a vision and the vision provided the team with the direction that they needed to move forward for God's kingdom God wanted Paul to go to Macedonia and then found eventually west to Rome there were people for him to reach and things for him to accomplish for God's glory So Paul did not continue trying to go into Asia. Instead, he changed his plans and headed into Greece. They became dedicated to God's direction, and the rest is history. As individuals and as a church, we must not lose sight of our purpose, calling, and mission our personal hopes, dreams, and desires that conflict with what God would have us to do must take a back seat to God's will. If we fail to follow God, we will miss opportunities that are waiting. There are people who need to hear the gospel who will not hear. There are people who need to be discipled who will be ignored. There are people who need encouragement who will be neglected, and there are communities and nations that need to be changed for his glory that will be lost. You know, I learned that lesson very early on in 
I wasn't even pastoring yet. I was a seminary student, and my secretary at the bank had gotten badly mugged. So bad that she was in the hospital. And I was driving into work when I got the call, so I went directly to the hospital to see who she, what was going on. And when I got there, she was in the hospital bed in emergency, and her face was all messed up. And, and, and I heard the Lord say, pray for her. And as I was going to pray for her, doctors and nurses and everybody came in, and, and I, I backed down. And, and I, you know, she had asked me to do some things, so I, I, I left and went to the office, and I called her up after I did those things, and I said, well, how are you doing now? And her response was, I'm better now. A woman came by and prayed for me. Thank God he sent somebody else because I messed up. But I learned an important lesson. God asked me to do something. I should have done it. Or somebody else is going to receive the blessing. Folks, when he asks us to do something, we must go ahead and do it. And I've gone off my notes. (laughs) When God gives a specific vision, we must, in full devotion, follow his direction. Now, I want to be perfectly clear. When God is giving direction to his church, he does not only speak to the pastor. He speaks to all those that are involved. You know, one of my favorite passages in Scripture is found in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Acts 13, 1 to 3. It says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. See, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So the church here was ministering to God, and God showed up. And the Holy Spirit spoke to who? Them. And they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas. See, see, the leaders, when when God is, is, is changing the direction of ministry, he will speak to the whole leadership. And if there's a major dissension from those that are in prayer, worshiping and fasting, then something is wrong. Sometimes you will find a dissenting voice and make sure that that they are in a right place with God and make sure that you have not moved too quickly in a new direction and God is trying to hold you back. The key is to confirm that what you hear is from God. Notice that in Acts chapter 13, they heard from God and what did they do? They went back to worship and fasting before changing direction. They went further time of listening, but not procrastination. Folks, it is not enough to simply know what God wants from us. We must be ready and more than willing to go and do it. I I like to add a letter to that tap that David Rebenschneider gave us, an R for personal and active response. It's not enough just to know his will. We got to be ready to go do something. We have to respond, which leads us to the final essential of an effective church, determination. When Paul received the call, he did not delay. They immediately set out to go to where the Lord had called them to go. When God gives us direction, we must take action in his timing. And in this case, it was immediate action. Yeah, and I I love that the scripture gives us Paul's itinerary. This trip was no joke. It was not, it wasn't nonstop. They went from ship to Troas to Neapolis to Philippi. And you know they had delays along the way. This trip not only took dedication, but it also took determination to get to where God was sending them. 
And notice that as they were going, God was working. God had already begun to prepare the hearts of those that the team would encounter there. And as soon as they reached Macedonia, people came to Christ. Folks, we must have the determination to obey God's will. Even when he sends us in a direction that's difficult. Even when he calls us to go to people we don't want to go to. Even when he calls us to stay places where we don't want to stay. Even when he calls us to do things that we don't want to do. Even when he calls us to change or stop what we're doing. And even when what he calls us to do will take much time and effort, we must be determined to obey God. You know, there, there, there's some people that need to, be determined, need to be determined to just get out of bed and out of their homes and back to church. Yeah. And that's, that's you people that are up there. Some of you I know can't, can't make it in. But if you can make it in, you should be in church. Right? But that's a message for another day. God has work for the First Alliance Church of Orlando. You know, I love our vision, vision and mission statements. Right? Anybody know what the, the mission statement is? Anybody know? All right. We love, we serve, we send. We love, we learn, we serve, we send. Anybody know the vision statement? It's up there already to see individuals and families transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ into a vibrant community of disciples that impacts Orlando and the world. It's kind of long to remember. God is leading you as individuals to be the church, not attend church. We must resolve that we are going to be faithful ambassadors of Jesus Christ at all times and build his kingdom for his glory. Then, as I said earlier, Jesus was build his church. Why do I keep saying that? Because that's what Jesus promised, right? He said, I will build my church. We just have to be faithful to what God has called us to do. We must continue our journey until the task that God has placed before us is complete. We must persevere no matter what difficulties we encounter. Even in the face of persecution and spiritual warfare, we must follow God's will. We must be determined to be what God would have us to be, to go where he would have us to go, and to do what he has called us to do. Worship team, come on up. Let me wrap this up. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he said, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. That should encourage us. No matter where we see we are as a church or as an individual, your labor is not in vain. But it starts with our desire to glorify God, wanting to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. And there should be a contagious excitement in God's people to do his will. It means that we must strive to discern God's will for our lives and for the church, worship, Prayer and fasting must become a way of life, not just a Sunday thing. It means that we must be dedicated to move in the direction that God leads us. God blesses whole communities when his church responds to him in surrender and obedience. And we must be determined to see God glorified. We're to play a role in helping others to see his kingdom grow. And this means a maximum effort on the part of God's people. What is God's will for First Alliance Church of Orlando? What does he want us to do? I've shortened the vision statement to make it easier for us to remember. 
to see all people transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. To see all people transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. And for us to be successful, we need to begin in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the beauty of it. We thank you for the truth that is revealed to us, Lord. But Lord, now we ask that you help us live your word. Live it in a way that honors you and glorifies you, Lord. Live it in a way where people who do not know you come to know you and love you and serve you as we do, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask your continued blessing in this place, Lord. But most importantly, Lord, we ask that you show us how we may glorify you and build your kingdom. Guide your church. Guide your people. Give us the strength, the desire, the dedication and determination to do your will, Lord. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, the one whom we want to honor and serve, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's continue in worship. Amen, would you stand?
Lord may be speaking to you this morning or something that he's put on your heart from what Pastor shared. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Let God do that work and be uh, desirous and determined. Pick one of the deeds that Pastor put out there this morning and let God move in your heart. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. <clears throat> if there's um, something we can pray for you for, um, I'd love to be able to join with you in that regard. I'm going to go back to where J.O. is sitting and pray for J.O. He fell this week and hurt his ankle, so I'm going to pray with him over that. Um, so if you'd like prayer, you can join us back there. Um, if you'd like to take other steps in your faith, like baptism, join a small group, become involved in the church, please feel welcome to them. The membership group has started on Thursday night at my house, so you're welcome to uh, come up. We haven't really gotten that far into the, the class yet, so to speak. Uh, Seven o'clock, so let me know, and you'll be, be having you join us there too. And there are, of course, ways that you can give of what God has given you to be involved in support, whether it's through the app, a text in person, or online, or in the box right back there. Um, I just want to mention again, with regard to what's going on, the last couple of things. Remember, Jim's going to be back at the table um, with regard to the Walk for Life, and um, there's cards, not just cards. Remember, these the whole thing we're doing, the, the, um, um, jo the VBS, I can get out, is for the kids. It's because we want them to hear about Jesus. We want them to know that. That's an opportunity for us. Be in prayer for it. Be preparing your hearts for it. Be preparing for your involvement. And be preparing to uh, invite as many people as we possibly can see God bring. He'll bring the ones he wants here. All we need to do is give the opportunity, okay? Let me pray for you and give you a benediction. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, and we invite you to work in us that everything we see and I do this morning would come from a desire to glorify you, would be following discerning what you desire for us, would lead us to that dedication that we're going to have to walk through the tough times, and it doesn't matter. You'll go with us. You'll be there with us. And that we must be determined in the ultimate and to see you glorified. Lord Jesus, as we lay this before you, we're coming to you to fill, invite you to take over in our hearts and our lives so that we might go out with that fullness and anticipation that you will use us as your vessels. You've set us apart as your priests and priestesses. Cause us to act like that as we go. In Jesus' name I pray. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, give you his shalom, his peace. I pray over you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in that peace, serve him well.